23 participants now, so I think we're ready to go and uh, welcome everybody to the Water Task Force. Um, we're all living through this COVID experience and, um, you know, there is some promising uh, news that related to treatments and vaccine that make me hopeful. Um, I also, I, I find it interesting that we have a president that's taking a mal malarial drug <laughs> uh, just because he thinks it could prevent COVID uh, and a speaker of the house that's praying for him. And I suggest that Nancy prays a little bit more for him. <laughs> um, I get thinking, uh, you know, what are the things that I miss through this COVID experience and, and what I'm not missing and what I do miss is, are the social interactions, of course. And uh, we get together with the Water Task Force planning group um, and over beers, and we talk about what our future meetings are gonna be and socialize, and those are good times. Those are the type of things that I miss. And speaking of the Water Task Force planning group, it's uh, my co-chair, Dan McIntyre, who you'll hear about hear from in just a minute, Bob Whitley, uh, Ann Spalding, Dave Riekla, Dave Richardson, Don Berger, Lindy uh, Lavender, and Kristen Conley. So thank you guys for your work. Um, other social gatherings that I miss is the, the guys in my neighborhood get together for poker once a quarter. And it's a nice thing because you can walk home from, <laughs> from being there and losing your money and, and enjoying the social experience. We tried, uh, we tried the virtual poker and it fell flat on its face. So no poker for, uh, for a while. And now we're in day 65 of this darn thing. And um, other things I'm missing is I host an annual golf tournament up at my cabin and, and uh, we haven't been able to do that this year. I missed my motorhome and we've had to cancel two camping trips uh, so far this year and, and I'm hoping that changes. What I'm not missing is shopping. I've always hated shopping anyhow, so there's a fact there's no shopping doesn't bother me in the least. <laughs> Household changes, my, uh, my hair at, at day 60 was getting uh, really bad and I see some bad hairdos out there uh, <laughs> on this uh, call but uh, Cindy cut cut my hair I think she did a darn good job at yeah. that uh, another talent that she learned uh, that she rediscovered was making uh, bread so we're getting fresh bread at home so turning you know to water stuff I always look at the drop monitor before these meetings and uh, Northern California in particular is in a dry dry year mode as of april 1st our snowpack is only at seven percent and that's not good however the storage in our major re reservoirs is over 90 percent today's topic uh, uh, is going to be fantastic eileen white is somebody that i've known for now approaching 20 years believe it or not and uh one couple of descriptors of eileen from my perspective is is high energy and uh, is somebody that is very forward thinking. And I think you'll hear that today in her presentation. I think it's fantastic what East Bay Mud is doing. And I think she can share with us what's happening in the world of COVID detection and uh, some pretty amazing uh, things that, that are going on. So thank you, Eileen, for uh, being willing to uh, present today. Bob Whitley will, will uh, actually do the introduction for you and the topic in just a minute. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Dan McIntyre to talk about our future um, meetings coming up. Uh, but before I do that, as soon as he's done, we'll have a, a moment that people can share announcements. So if there's announcements from the East Bay Leadership Council, if there's announcements out there that the rest of our group should know, that would be the time to, um, to give those. And I think, Lindy, that they can do that by... Um, accessing you through chat or raise their hand, I think. Okay, very good. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan for uh, uh, upcoming meetings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We've got a lot of uh, meetings planned ahead uh, over the next couple of months in June. Our topic is going to be where did our water go? And we're going to look at the impact of the drought and water conservation on water, wastewater, and recycled utilities. I know for a lot of agencies, particularly for DSRSD and its recycled water partner, it's been interesting to see wastewater flows at our plant actually go down and it creates some interesting challenges for how do we supply more recycled water when the wastewater uh, supply is going down. So that'll be interesting. That's gonna be a panel discussion led by uh, Katie Ruby of Brown and Caldwell. And then in July, we're going to have an overview of the California Water Resilience Initiative, the governor's plan 
and Nancy Vogel, who's the director of the Governor's Water Portfolio Program, is going to be our speaker in July. Uh, we have lots and lots of topics lined up. I mean, probably 15 plus ideas in the hopper. Uh, the real challenge is to get um, good speakers uh, to give presentations on these excellent topics. So if any of you have ideas of topics you'd like to add to the hopper, particularly if you have a great speaker that you know of, if you would share that with one of the Water Task Force uh, planning members, uh, that'd be great. And we can, we can get those into the mix and make sure we always have uh, top-notch presentations going forward. I do know that the planning team is meeting uh, next Tuesday, May 26th, to bet the ideas that we have, plus any you may, you may toss out there. Uh, so get your ideas in before Tuesday if you'd like us to consider those in the mix. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lindy on how we're gonna handle uh, announcements and chat during the meeting. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Yes, there's a chat here in Zoom. If you've ever um, been on Zoom before, you're probably somewhat familiar that most of your controls are on the bottom of your screen. That includes participants, which is a list of who's here in the meeting with us, and chat. Chat is what we're going to use for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to either send them to me privately through the chat or just send them to everyone. Um, sending them to everyone tends to be really helpful because then people can see what's already been asked. And after Eileen's fantastic presentation, I'm going to be moderating the questions that have come through the chat and directing those to her. In regards to East Bay Leadership Council, we've been ramping up task forces and, and holding some of them a little bit more often than we normally do just to make sure we can be responsive during this very unique time. Uh, next week, we have a healthcare task force that's going to talk about a nonprofit survey that was done by the Stanford University sorry, Stanford Institute at JFK and the Lesher uh, Foundation was one of the partners in that. And so Melissa Stafford-Jones is gonna be presenting it. We're also gonna be getting some member updates and talking about the May Revise. So those of you interested in health, I definitely recommend that you join us next week. The other thing I wanted to mention is that on May 28th, we're having a live streamed event with Connor Doherty. He is a New York Times reporter who wrote a book about the Yes in My Backyard housing movement that talks a lot about the Bay Area. There's actually a chapter specifically that discusses Lafayette. So if housing is something of interest to you, I definitely recommend you join us. It's a free event that we're actually gonna be live streaming probably through Facebook, but um, yeah, if you're interested, we hope that you'll, you'll tune in. Again, that's May 28th. That's the extent of my announcements. I think I'm going to therefore hand it over. Okay, so we've got uh, Bob Whitley lined up our speaker this month as a practice in our water task force planning group. If you have an idea and line up a speaker, you get to do the introduction. So, Bob, it's all yours. Close the door this time. Bob, you're still on mute. Can you unmute him? How about that? Can you see? There we go. Huh? Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Yep. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Um, Certainly miss um, seeing all of you and just chatting, but it, the pleasure is I didn't have to get in the car this morning, so um, get to do this big by TV. Um, so our speaker, Gary's already did given some introduction, but Eileen is uh, the director of wastewater. That means she's the, the, the general manager of the wastewater enterprise at East Bay Mud. A uh, very influential and very important position that she holds. Uh, she's an East Bayer, uh, grow, growing up in the East Bay, went to Cal, got her civil engineering degree, started work at PG&E, and then went to East Bay Mud, and has had a, a varied career. Her past career was trying to figure out how to make sure that the water from that fell in the McCallany River Basin was became available and usable in the East Bay. So she was always worried about not enough flow. Now, she's director of wastewater, and she, her operation has to take all the flow, whether she's it's high or low. So it's quite a shift in responsibilities. And it's, she was promoted to that position a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, and she's gonna talk today about the changes that have caused a revisiting of their master planning effort looking into the future. Um, when she was growing up and learning about potty training, little did she know that someday she would be the chief potty manager <laughs> <laughs> of the East Bay. Um, but our generation had a very simple task. It was, it was complicated, but it was very focused. It was clean up 
the waters of the San Francisco Bay. And that has happened. But now there are many other challenges uh, that Eileen and her team has been looking at, as well as the complication of COVID-19. So Eileen, thank you. And thank you for your flexibility in adjusting calendars over the last six months or so. So looking forward to your presentation. Sure. Great. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, first off, I want to thank you for the great introduction and for allowing me to talk about a couple topics today. First, I was asked to talk about our master plan, and that was before COVID-19. And now with COVID-19, I've added on another whole presentation to kind of talk about what we've been doing as a wastewater utility responding to COVID-19 and then about our wastewater surveillance uh, program. So to start off with, I'll just talk a little bit about our master plan. I'm going to talk about what we kind of accomplished last year and I'm reflecting and I've been the director of wastewater for about three years now. I've been recycled back. I'd worked in the water system for 20 years running, um, managing the entire operations of the water system and before that the seismic program but earlier in my career, I had worked in wastewater. So it's fun to be back. And it's kind of interesting seeing how things have changed and how they haven't changed. So I want to review some of our drivers for the master plan. I'm going to give you an overview of our master plan and talk about how we're doing a blended approach. We've got consultants and we've got leveraging our internal, I've got an incredible talented team and we're leveraging their expertise um, in developing this master plan. So these are just to kind of give you an idea of what we've been kind of doing. And our plant was built in the 50s and secondary treatment was added in the 70s. So um, the plant's old. And as you all know, wastewater is very corrosive. But over the last couple of years, I'm proud to say we finished the Third Street Interceptor, which is our large, it was one of our large interceptors. It's nine foot in diameter here in West Oakland. And last year we finished rehabbing over 4,000 feet of it. And we actually won an ACE of the year award for it. But we've also been working on our digesters or North Richmond equalization tank. And we realized since I've come back to wastewater three years ago, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. So our five year CIP is about $262 million. Um, I was proud to develop a CIP and operating budget that minimized rate increases and it also reduced our debt financing. So we're in good position. It set us up for the future, knowing that we've got future capital investments to make. So kind of previous focus plans. Over the years, you know, the wastewater department's been very innovative and even dating back to 1990, they developed a sludge management plan. And then 1996, they did a land use plan. And the 1998, you know, people started complaining about the odors when we were doing you know, our comp grow and, and so we developed an odor control plan. And so there's been various plans over the years, but what I came here, I'm like, we can't keep doing these individual plans. We need to have one integrated plan. We've got changing regulations. We've got changing air regulations, changing water regulations with nutrients. We got changing regulations for biosolids. We've got our aging infrastructure. We've got the seismic vulnerabilities. Our plant is built on bay mud. And then in addition, we've got climate change. So things have changed and doing one little focus plan at a time is not the way to go in today's world. So what we have is our drivers, as I mentioned, is our aging infrastructure, the more stringent regulations, climate change, and then looking at our capacity. You know, up until this uh, global pandemic, if you came to downtown Oakland six months ago, you couldn't drive the streets of Oakland with all the high rises and construction going on. There's been a lot of infill and densification uh, happening in downtown Oakland. All the large parking lots are now taken over by condo building. So we need to factor that into our planning. So just to kind of give you a merit of the regulations we're facing, uh, I'm really proud we got our second nutrient watershed permit issued in May of last year. And it was a collaborative effort working uh, with the other 36 POTWs in the Bay Area, the Regional Board, Baykeeper, and Bakwa, we really did a nice job coming up with a permit 
that allows us five years to study the science longer instead of investing in nutrient treatment. And for those of you who you're probably aware, nutrients, San Francisco estuary is a very nutrient enriched estuary and the POTWs in the Bay Area contribute over 19% of the nutrients. I mean, over 90% of the nutrients and East Bay mud contributes 19%. And if we were to go to full treatment, we're looking at, it would be $2 billion. So the approach we took is we talked to the regulators and we have all these other competing priorities. I've talked to them about our master plan. Let's not just develop load limits. Let's come up with, uh, if we're gonna have reg regulations for nutrients, let's make sure it's based on sound science. So that's where we're at right now. We've got five years. I'm on the nutrient management strategy team as part of uh, being a BACWA board member. And I'm really proud of the effort that's happening with SFEI, the regional board, to really understand nutrients in San Francisco Bay. We have our MPDS permit. A lot of you are aware of SB 1383. The regulations are being finalized. 50% of organics are supposed to be diverted from landfills by 2020. Well, it's now 2020. It took them so long to develop the regs that they don't go into effect for a couple of years, but they want 75% diverted by 2025. We've got the toxic air pollution reduction. Uh, we've got the consent decree. We're under a consent decree in our year eight check-ins in 2022. So this just kind of tells you the world is changing in wastewater and you can't just sit back. It's not a spectator sport. We need to be proactive and we need to be forward thinking in how we're gonna address these competing regulations so we make no regrets in our infrastructure and make the best use of the ratepayer dollar. So what's the master plan gonna integrate? We're gonna look at our R2 program. And for those of you who are aware, the R2 program started in about 2004 and it was you know, very innovative at the time but things have changed. It hardly pays us now to produce electricity. So that's something we need to look at. With all the renewable energy that's come on in California right now, it's almost cheaper to buy electricity, but we need to take a look at it from the environmental standpoint. So we're looking at it in that regards with regard to the master plan. We've got to look at our site use. We've got to look at the beneficial uses of wastewater for biogas, biosolids, fertilizer, recycled water. So these are kind of the different aspects of the master plan. And the master plan is going to basically integrate all of these. We're not, we're not going to just have a facilities plan or a resource recovery plan or a power generation supply plan. We're going to look at it holistically to come out with our roadmap for the future. So what's our approach? It's a teamed approach. And as I mentioned, I'm very lucky to have a very talented staff here. So we're leveraging the expertise of our operations and maintenance staff. Our operators who've been here for 5, 10, 20 years and maintenance staff they have a lot of knowledge. So we wanna make sure we're tapping into that. We're also looking at our, our Maximo and our work orders. What's, what keeps failing? What, what's, what's the preventive maintenance? What's the uh, reactive maintenance that we've had to do in corrective maintenance? We're leveraging our talented engineers. Our lab staff have a lot of knowledge. And then we've hired a talented consulting team to help blend us in areas where we don't have that expertise. And then we have our steering committee. And then of course we keep our board apprised. So today we've had 20 steering committees, which is made up of our, my management team and a few selected experts uh, on our staff. We've had six internal workshops, which include representatives from throughout the department. And then we've had 13 workshops with our consultants. So what's our guiding principles? Well, we definitely wanna take into account no point coming up with a roadmap that we can't afford. It's gotta be environment, it's gotta address the environmental considerations, the social considerations, and our solutions have to be technically. So our guiding principles are basically, we wanna make sure we maintain fair rates through cost-effective, no regrets investments in our in infrastructure. We wanna be able to provide reliable wastewater treatment to meet increasingly more stringent regulations. We wanna maximize sustainability. It's gotta be the roadmap for the future and we wanna be more resilient, especially with climate change. And then we wanna be a good neighbor. We're located in West Oakland. And for any of you who haven't been to West Oakland the last couple of years, it's way different than when I started the district over 20 years ago. It's now a really a booming area. There's a lot of young people have moved in. There's condos, there's apartment buildings. It's really changed. So it's important that we become good neighbors and that we continue our good practice of minimizing odors from the wastewater plant. So a little bit about what we've done in-house um, is on our aging infrastructure, I'm really proud 
that the district team did a very extensive system condition assessment, which I'm going to talk about. We're um, conducting a seismic evaluation. We've been actively involved in the regulatory development. Um, I'm on the uh, board, I mentioned, of BACWA. I uh, chair the Climate Change and Resilience Committee for NACWA, and we're actively involved in working with CASA. It's a wonderful group of CASA and their climate change group. Um, and then we got Climate Change Modern Impacts and Adaptation Plan. The Wastewater Department last year prepared the first ever Wastewater Climate Change Modern Response Plan. And we're taking the findings from that plan and incorporating that into the master plan. We're doing a market assessment for R2 waste and looking at the potential use of our excess biogas. As I mentioned, the cost of electricity has come down. So we're looking at other potential uses for our biogas, including fuel for vehicles. And then of course, we wanna collaborate with our recycled water team to look at our future needs. And then we're looking I think we may have lost Eileen for a moment there. There's tanks, mechanical equipment. And so our talented team work closely, our engineers with She's gone again. Yeah, that can happen sometimes. <laughs> I'm gonna give her a second um, to see if her with bandwidth comes back. Eileen, we missed a little part of that presentation. How far back? Probably go back one slide. Okay, the condition assessment? Yep. Okay, great, thanks. So we conducted a comprehensive assessment of our various assets at the plant. We have over 950 assets, and it was our own engineering staff working closely with the O&M team. And the next slide shows you the findings. Basically, most of our infrastructure is very old. Only 25% is even in good shape. 39% is in fair shape. So if we continue business as usual, there'd be a spike in 2035. Well, as you all know, you don't want to spike your customers' rates and you want to plan. You don't just all of a sudden one year say, oops, my house is falling apart. I need to rebuild it. You want to you know, be very uh, strategic and systematic about it. And so we're taking the findings from the condition assessment and incorporating it into our master plan. So the takeaways are the renewal forecast shows big spending milestones for maintaining business as usual. So we won't be doing business as usual. And it doesn't take into account even the extra investments to address the new drivers. Spending decisions got to, must be strategic and they must consider the long-term to make those no regrets investments in our infrastructure. We don't want to rehab uh, a building at the plant and then realize, oops, that building's gonna go away because we're gonna put membrane treatment in there to address nutrients. So we need to be strategic and um, that's important as we move forward with our master plan. And then just thinking back to, you know, when our plant was built in the 50s and, and secondary treatment added in the 70s, well, you think back to the Loma Prieta earthquake, which happened here, you know, we felt the impacts in West Oakland and in fact, several of the wastewater treatment plant operators were really rescue heroes during the Loma Prieta earthquake and they exited the plant. They left their stations and went out to save people when the Cypress stretcher failed. So we knew how vulnerable we were, but since then we've conducted several seismic studies, but we've never spent the money. When I was in the water system back in the 90s, I led the seismic improvement program. It was a $189 million 10 year program to seismically retrofit the water system. We have never done that at the wastewater plant. Meanwhile, the wastewater plant is built on bay mud. And what this slide shows you is just a snapshot of all the changes in the seismic codes over time. The seismic codes continue to change each time we have an earthquake, we go out, we learn something new, and it's a new code. So our job now is to look at our wastewater plant and figure out what buildings need to be rehabbed. What improvements do we need to make, make so that our workers are gonna be safe working at the plant? And so what is our seismic evaluation shown? Well, we've evaluated over 80 facilities. We ranked them by seismic risk. And basically we looked at what's the consequence of failure. And our key takeaway is life safety is the number one priority. Our current focus right now includes geotech investigations, 
some structural evaluations, and what's the cost to retrofit. So that's what we're focused on right now, and we've made good progress. And then the next thing we have to look at in the master plan is what's the you know, projections for the Bay Area. And the key takeaway is before the drought, our flows were much higher. And so we've seen decreased flows since we used to be up on an average day at about 80 million gallons per day. But since the drought, East Bay Mud has seen the water usage drop over 30% in the last, you know, since the last drought that we had. Um, so as a result of seeing water use drop by 30%, average flow is no longer 80 MGD, it's about 50 million gallons per day. But the question is, you don't plan for today, we're looking at 30 years. So what are key takeaways is our wastewater service area boundaries are unlikely to change, but we need to consider the local development and coordinate that with our water demand studies. And projections include additional low and high growth scenarios to capture the various uncertainties. But we're definitely going to see growth in the coming years, and we want to include that into our master plan. So he, this is just showing you the flows. This shows you at doing the wet period. So this on the horizontal axis, it starts in January. And as you can see, we see peak flows right now in the middle of winter. It's not uncommon to get several atmospheric rivers coming in and see our flows quickly go up to over 200, 250 million gallons per day in the wintertime. But if you look now into May, you know, we're 50 MGD around here, and this is showing an average over the last decade. So this shows you the historical flow, and then the blue shows you our model flow with the consent decree compliance. So we're working collaboratively with the other satellites that we serve, there's seven of them. We have a regional consent decree, and we're fixing they're fixing their aging pipes that uh, have inflow and infiltration in times of, flow, of winter. We're fixing our interceptors, and then we have a private sewer lateral program. So what you can see with the blue, you see the historical flow is, is showing 1993 to 2019. And then the blue is showing what we're projecting for the future when we have this consent decree and we've taken the 22 years to rehab the satellite collection system and then also our private sewer lateral. And there's about 1,600 miles of regional collection system, and there's about 1,600 miles of private sewer lateral. The takeaway is, in the future, there's still gonna be a distinct wet weather season with peaks, but the consent decree is expected to significantly reduce the wet weather flows, as you can see in the graph. Climate change, well, we're all aware of climate change, and got to experience it managing the operations of the water system during the driest four year period. And only two years later, get to manage the water system through the wettest winter on record, where we emptied Party Reservoir nine times that winter and got Comanche Reservoir, which is our other large reservoir in the McCollumy, got within a foot of spilling. Um, so we, climate change is real. We've seen droughts where, for uh, the wastewater system. We're gonna see uh, the lower per capita water consumption is going to result in reduced flows coming to the plant. There'll be changes in the influent wastewater flow and characteristics. And what we need to be careful and mindful of is the potential for biological upsets. With the atmospheric rivers and flooding that's projected, there'll be increased inflow and infiltration. And we hope to address that significantly as showed in the previous slide with our regional consent decree as we work collaboratively with the other satellites we serve to reduce the infiltration and inflow. Sea level rise, we've looked at the studies. Luckily, we have time, but now's the time. As I said, it's not a spectator sport. Now's the time to start preparing because it's going to take time. For the, uh, on the right photo, you can see our vulnerable infrastructure there right on the bay. So really, sea level rise is a regional problem. If you look at you know, where our plant is located, you've got pg e lines, you've got WAPA lines, you've got the railway lines, you've got Caltrans, you've got the Port of Oakland. It's a regional problem that requires a regional solution, and now's the time to start the planning so we can execute on our plan before sea level rise occurs in several decades. Then our resource recovery program. So we have our low strength, which is, um, is our R2, and we have our high strength. The low strength brines is an opportunity for growth, the salty waste, and high strength, the real growth is food waste. Um, as we know with SB 1383, and 75% of organics need to be diverted from landfills by 20, 
25, there's a real opportunity for the state of California to show leadership in addressing climate change by taking that food waste, bringing it to the POTWs in the state and generating renewable electricity or fuel. So what do we need to look at? When we evaluate our resource recovery program, there's the pros of the re revenues, there's the pros of the renewable and resilient energy, which will benefit potential on-site nutrient removal and biosolids processing, and there's the global environmental benefits. You take this waste and you take it out of landfills where they'd be generating methane. Now the co cons are, there's capital and o and costs. You know, you don't build a food waste project, and some of you are probably aware, before I became director three years ago, the district had embarked on an ambitious food waste project. They were visionary, but they were a little ahead of their times. They signed on to a 10-year agreement with the city of Oakland, and they ended up, once they started building, started to get the cost for the infrastructure, it was way more than they anticipated, and East Bay Mud breached the contract with the city of Oakland. I'm dealing with the consequences of that. Um, it's a learning opportunity. Sometimes when you're a leader, uh, you make mistakes. And uh, we made a mistake. We were ahead of our times and the technology wasn't sophisticated enough and the market conditions weren't sophisticated enough. But I feel that there's a future for food waste. We were just a little too early. The other mistake we made is it was a forced marriage. Oakland did not want to be in this partnership. You never start a marriage setting it up and saying you're going to marry somebody. So I think there's a real future and waste management is five years into their agreement with Oakland. When it expires in five years and we've been developing a really good relationship, I've been working collaboratively with them on this nutrient program, that I think there's a real opportunity to do potentially a big food waste project in the Bay Area where we're not trucking this stuff to the Central Valley where there's large trucks burning electricity, burning you know, fossil fuel, hauling stuff to the Central Valley, and that's what waste management is doing right now. So I think there's an opportunity, with, and we have to look at the other con of it is, it does create more nutrients and biosolids to handle, and then there's a challenge for air permits and greenhouse gas goals. So we're gonna be looking at, at this all as part of the master plan and have our roadmap for the future. So the key takeaway is food waste has many benefits, but comes at a cost and comes with challenges. The master plan is gonna evaluate the pros and cons to align with the guiding principles and other district goals. But the R2 program has to be financially independent. It can't be subsidized by our rate payers. It's its, it's, its own entity. And I did, at, since I became director, a very detailed analysis of the R2 program. And it, you know we talk about, whoa, we make $12 million a year. But what I did is I looked at what does it cost to run the program? It costs a lot of money to run the program. So we don't net that. So we're gonna be thoughtful when we move forward and it's not gonna be subsidized by West Oakland neighbors. So we're only gonna do it if it's financially makes sense. And as I mentioned, with the cost of electricity coming down, the biggest value of the R2 program right now is the electricity we generate on site, which makes us more resilient now with public safety power shutoffs coming in the fall. But the power we sell to the Port of Oakland, we barely break even. And when that co contract is up in another two years, it will be difficult to negotiate a contract that will be cost beneficial to the district because they can get cheaper renewable electricity other ways. Um, so that's kind of the R2 program. And I guess kind of in summary, as we look at the resource recovery program, and as I look at the main wastewater treatment plan, I no longer look at the main wastewater treatment plant maybe when I was a young engineer working in wastewater over 20 years ago. It's really a resource recovery center. As we try to address climate change, how can we take our biosolids and really have good use? You know, either make biochar and do carbon sequestration, compost. How do we take our, our and create recycled water? What's the best way to uh, address our nutrients? So we really want to look at our plant as looking at resilient and sustainable energy and solutions. Um, so it's really an opportunity to really look at it as a resource recovery center. And so the main takeaway is leveraging the main plant as a re resource recovery center is going to remain our long-term goal, but we have to balance it with other competing priorities and we have to look at the costs. Um, there's costs to running the R2 program and you can't ignore those. And um, we now have a very detailed cost account of what it costs to run the R2 program. So basically our roadmap for the future, key takeaway, it's not linear, 
It's phased based on triggers. It's got to be adaptable. Eileen, I think we lost you for a second there. We engage with the regulators at the appropriate time. And I'm so happy to say that I met with Tom Munley and his entire team in late February on a Friday. <clears throat> Eileen, can I make a suggestion? If it's okay with you, I'm gonna turn off your video just to see if that helps with the bandwidth. And meanwhile, we've got to maintain fair and reasonable rates, and we're at a time when less people can uh, pay their rates than ever before. And then, of course, we want to stay in communication with our community, neighbors, and West Oakland lay assigned group. So next infrastructure workshop is going to be later this year, and we're going to present our roadmap for the future to the board, and we'll be happy to share it with others. Next, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I got to, uh, asked to speak about COVID-19 and lessons learned. And you may be wondering, what's Eileen doing showing the Princess cruise ship on her slide? Well, the reason I'm showing you the Princess cruise ship is I distinctly remember hearing the evening news and seeing Gavin Newsom and Libby Schaap on the news saying, yep, Princess cruise ship is coming into the Port of Oakland tomorrow and it's going to be docked and we've got plans all worked out. Well, the one thing they forgot to say is it was coming in with a uh, cruise ship full of waste. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how I got a desperate call one evening. But real quick, you all know about our uh, East Bay Mud, but I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the water system when I talk about responding. So um, there's 2,000 employees, and I want to make sure when I talk about how we're responding to COVID-19, I'm gonna primarily focus on wastewater, but a lot of the same strategies are being used on the water side. So I'm gonna give you an update, talk about our reconstitution plan and the fiscal impacts. And reconstitution plan is really just the emergency preparedness term for really transitioning our employees back to work. And I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so basically we used to, what I talked about last time, before COVID-19, we were doing water shutoffs um, for our customers who didn't pay. Well, we're in a global health crisis, you, and what do you need more than anything to protect yourself from getting COVID-19? Wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water. So we have gone out in the last six weeks and quickly restored water to all customers who lost water. Um, and um, so that'll be interesting. I mean, and, and our, it's gonna be a new norm, uh, while we're in a global pandemic, I do not see us turning water off from customers anymore. And we also know we're in the, we have the highest unemployment rate since the Greatest Depression. So later I'll talk about the financial impacts. But basically we now have people telecommuting for those who are showing up to work. We've secured uh, parking for them. We've increased the cleaning. We've, uh, our essential workers continue to work. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our rotation program. So talk about flattening the curve. So kind of want to give you uh, the timeline here. You can see that where we're doing in the Bay Area, and I want to show you back in March when the cruise ship came in, we were still on the rise. And just briefly to tell you about that, the cruise ship came in, I got a phone call uh, one evening at about six o'clock saying, we arrived in Port Aileen, we'd like to discharge our waste into your sewer system. And I said, I need to know about your waste. And this was, you know, the infamous cruise ship with the coronavirus. Meanwhile, the coronavirus was all over the news. I got their information. I said, I need to issue a special discharge permit. I issued them a special discharge permit, but would not execute on it until I met with all the unions, told them what we were doing, told them the plan I had uh, put together very quickly. And I uh, consulted with Centers for Disease Control so I could tell my unions and my staff that yeah, the Center for Disease Controls uh, concurs with my plan and Alameda County Public Health. And then I sent a note to all 280 employees and the department. 24 hours later, we started taking waste from the uh, cruise ship. So, and they basically ended up delivering waste to us for six weeks while they were here at the Port of Oakland. But because of the concern of the coronavirus and worker safety, it was really important to do the communications with our staff. But since that time, we've seen flattening of the curve. 
And what else has changed? Now, anybody who reports to work, whether you report at the plant or downtown, you must complete the symptoms checklist every day before you report to work and let your supervisor say that you've checked no to all of these and you're good to come to work. We've executed on testing for our central staff, for our operation staff, for our maintenance staff that work at the plant, and for our lab staff. So that's just one of the strategies and they're tested every two weeks. We're monitoring our supply chain. And the only thing that we've had trouble getting to date was hand sanitizers. And I'll tell you how we dealt with that. We dealt with our ability to get hand sanitizers when you couldn't get it. What do you do? You make your own. So here you'll see bottles of hand sanitizers that I'm proud to say my district lab staff said, guys, we need hand sanitizers. And then they called me and said, Eileen, we can't get the ingredients. And I said, have you checked with the distilleries? And they're like, oh, what distilleries? I said, do I look like I know distilleries? Um, I said, I Googled distilleries. I said, I'll have my secretary, I have an amazing admin. She called them all. To, next thing we knew, we were getting the ingredients. And here you see bottles of hand sanitizers that our lab staff now proudly produces with pictures in the background, as you can see, our main wastewater treatment plant. And it even says, if you read the fine print, it's made with love by our lab staff. So it's really great that our lab staff own this and they continue to produce it. And it was important because we had run out of hand sanitizers and could not purchase it. You know, in a time like this, it's, I'm happy to report there's improved communications. I've been a director that normally sends out emails regularly to my staff, you know, on January 1st at 12, 15 in the morning said, hey, congratulations. We did another perfect MPDS uh, record. But what this has really done is with so many of my team, all our engineers, pretty much 90% of them are telecommuting. We're now conducting, I do town hall meetings every two weeks. I have one this afternoon where I open it up. I acknowledge everybody for their work and I give any updates as what, what's occurred. And then I kind of give my vision for what I see is happening in the next few weeks, the next month. And then I basically open it up and I'm available to answer questions. And if people want to just share that, you know, I said, if you want to share your frustration, I said, I can only imagine being a parent now who's now a teacher. As a mom of three boys, my husband and I are just like so happy. We can get through COVID-19 because we're not homeschooling three boys. They're old enough, but I could, I'd be pulling my hair out right now if I was trying to work at East Bay Mud and try to teach three we have a bunch of boys through school. So it's also an opportunity, these town hall meetings, for people to share their concerns or what's going well. You know, someone's learned a new trick on Microsoft Teams, they share it. Or someone shares their frustration that earlier in the week, their internet connection kept failing because of our district servers weren't working. So it's really provided a great forum for people just to talk and communicate. And some of my staff who've been telecommuting now for almost two months, they're feeling pretty isolated that they said they really enjoy these town hall meetings. So it's been a great way to improve communications throughout the department. All 280 employees are invited and I usually have over half the department at least participating. And considering that I have shift workers, I think that's really great. Construction back on. So with the new revised order that uh, came out on April 30th, for our big pipeline crews on the water site that had been on rotation and gone home, we had several hundred uh, plumbers on the water side home. They're back working again. Um, for wastewater, we have had a very small rotation program for our day operators to allow social distancing in order that they all don't get sick at once and a very small rotation program for our maintenance staff. We primarily have been working and we've executed numerous strategies at the plant in order to keep our workers safe and to make sure that they can follow the CDC guidelines for uh, social distancing. We've been providing information for our staff um, about the child care information for essential workers in the Bay Area so they have that information. So then I want to talk briefly about COVID-19 and our wastewater surveillance that we're doing. So I think our problem can be succinctly summarized in the two pie charts. First, we have a severe lack of testing for people who are shown symptoms. To date, less than 1% of California's population of 39 million people have been tested. Second, if people are shown symptoms, they can't even get tested. So what are we gonna do about the 25% of people who get infected but are asymptomatic? Well, our solution lies within wastewater. 
Coronavirus is protected in feces, not only as the infection develops, but also for several weeks after showing symptoms. So the way this works is, as people flush their waste, it enters the sewer systems, and the presence of coronavirus in wastewater, referred to as a sewage signal, presents a remarkable opportunity for us to track the spread of the virus throughout the community over time and spatially. In other words, we can sample the influence of the treatment plant for the entire community, or we can get very granular and, and test in various areas within a service area. We've been sampling wastewater in our three interceptors to track the sewage signal. And we've also begun sampling our final effluent just to verify the disinfection process is, it, it is effective at inactivating the viruses. We're confident we are, and luckily since there's no reporters, on this phone call, I'm waiting for the day for the reporter to stick the microphone in front of our PIO officer or she hands it off to me and said, have you tested your wastewater to confirm that the wastewater that's going to San Francisco Bay does not have coronavirus in it? I'm confident it doesn't, but we sent it to a lab so I can not say, I, I, I'm 99% sure, but I can confidently say, yes, we've got the results in hand. So what have we been doing? So we've been partnering with numerous universities, um, private companies and labs across the United States and results should be available at the end of May. We're partnering with Stanford with, and Stanford's got 10 other POTWs in the Bay Area. It's a, a brilliant team I'm working with down there. The problem is getting their lab up and running has taken time. Um, the University of Arizona is another great um, team there. They've been extremely limited also because of the shelter in place orders that have been in effect. They can only have one person in the lab. I want to sample hundreds of samples a day. But Dr. Gerba and Dr. Pepper there are also real experts. I'm also sending samples to the University of South Carolina and partnering with some great uh, professors there who we are partnering with the Centers for Disease Control. And there we're not only looking at wastewater as a surveillance tool uh, for an indicator of the presence of coronavirus in the community, but we're also looking at what's the potential exposure to wastewater operators and we're involved in a study with them there. We've also been sending samples to a private lab in Boston that's partnering with Harvard and MIT. Um, a lot of us are looking at those results uh, very cautiously. I want to be careful, uh, but they're more out. I think they were, they're doing it and I'm, I'm concerned that they're not necessarily out for sound science as they are to really generate business and they're going to like be charging a lot in June. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, we've got results, but I'm cautious. So what I want to do is, is all these universities doing these testing, and, and then you got this private firm who's trying to do all these samples. And really what we need to do, and I've been talking with the Eileen, we lost you there for a second. We might need to go back to you talking about the different collaborations. I mean, it should all be available at, 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 in early June. I'm very confident in the results we're going to get. Oh. I think she's just losing mm -hmm. some bandwidth. Hey, and, I uh, Yeah. I think we lost you there a little bit. Would you mind going back? Certainly. You were you were finishing up talking about these collaborations, but we just lost you for the last probably about a minute and a half. Okay, thanks for letting me know. So basically, did I talk, did you hear about the alternatives evaluation that I've been doing? I think that that's a good place to go back to. Okay, so the purpose is each of these universities are doing it, it's new to them. So what we're doing is, so they can feel good about their results and Stanford and Berkeley are real excited that we're, we're sending our samples. So the exact same samples are going to all these labs. And so we're gonna be able to compare results. And so the goal is to be able to compare results and have results available in early June. And so how this works is the sewage signal represents the spread of the virus at the population level, not the individual level. As a result, the potential impact of the sewage signal is much larger than that of coronavirus testing. So like, as I'm looking as we're starting to begin to lift these shelter in place orders, I'm beginning to wonder what's happening. 
How much of coronavirus? Are we gonna have to wait two months and then have our hospitals flooded again? That's the concern. So sewage can be a real useful tool and being able to identify as they start lifting these shelter in place orders, what's happening. I've been coordinating with the Centers for Disease Control, Alameda County Public Health, Contra Costa County Public Health and Berkeley's public health officers. I've been coordinating with all of them. They're excited to get these results. Unfortunately, when I reached out to get funding from them two months ago, even with the president making all this funding available for COVID-19 and the governor, I could not get state or federal funding. The good news is we do have private funding available um, for both at Stanford and at Berkeley. So we're gonna be able to take this model for the Bay Area and definitely grow it for Northern California. And if we can get the testing barriers worked out, we can do this for the entire state. So the goal is you use the sewage signal, we can bridge the testing gap, we can monitor trends in real time and initiate responses where necessary. And the, the, this monitor can provide public health and medical professionals with a leading indicator of anticipated infection dynamics versus the lagging indicator of case counts. And they can assist in targeting early population testing and focus on the appropriate public health measures such as quarantine and overall supply and resource distribution to enable the state's response system to be more efficient. I've been partnering with the largest healthcare provider in California and they're very excited for me to get the results in June. And they even said they'd be willing to, to help put money towards this because they want this to go also beyond Northern California to Southern California since they're the largest healthcare provider in California. And I told her once I can get the lab issues worked out. Right now, the biggest constraint has been lab capacity, but I'm working with two labs at Berkeley that we think we're gonna be able to take this biotics lab and be able to turn it into a lab that can do several hundred samples a day. If we can make that happen, then we can make this go beyond just a little bit that we're doing with these university labs that are very limited. Beyond the Bay Area, take it to the state and even replicate the state model throughout the country. I pitched it a few weeks ago uh, to private for, to go after private funding since since basically I can't get anything the state or federal government now that the state is is got its own economic issues and you know as far as the president's concerned this issue is behind us so I've gone private and I found an organization uh, private funding um, that I'm still in the running for getting money uh, stopthespread.org which is a group of uh, like 1,200. CEOs throughout the country that have been frustrated with the federal government's lack of response and coordination. So I've taken this idea to them and um, I'm still in the running for money because I'd like to replicate this model from the Bay Area in the state and take it throughout the country. We are far away from any vaccine. This may be here for more than 18 months. There's, no re there's nothing to believe there's gonna be a vaccine in 18 months. And then you gotta ask yourself, when that vaccine comes out, do you wanna be one of the first people to take that vaccine when it's been rushed you know, to market. So if we can use sewage to help guide the medical professionals, I think it's a real opportunity here. So basically we wanna start small, East Bay Mud, grow it to uh, Alameda Contra Costa County, the Bay Area, take it to the state and the country. And this just kind of shows you a model that you know, you take it week week one. What could happen in week two? If the spread's happening. You could send resources to Southern California if it was a nice weekend. Everyone went to the beach, didn't observe social distancing, and by week three, the county health officers in Southern California could issue shelter in place for Southern California, and then the largest healthcare provider could send their nurses, their ventilators, their N95 masks to Southern California. So that's kind of the vision. So the question is, how can we get creative and collaborate to find funding? And as I mentioned, when I couldn't get it from the Centers for Disease Control, I couldn't get it from the county health officers, I've gone private now. So that's where we're at with that. And this just shows you the timeline. The first case was in, came in California, January 26. The first death was February 6. We've been in shelter in place at least till the end of uh, May, and we're slowly but surely starting our transition back. But let's be real, the worst is still ahead of us from my perspective. The fall's coming, there's no vaccine, there's not enough testing. 
Um, so if we can use sewage to help save lives and to protect public health, that's what we're all about in the wastewater industry. So just quickly to walk you through what we're doing, we're doing testing for our operators, maintenance staff and lab staff. We're trying to do our own contact tracing actually within uh, at the plant. Any building you go into, we're tracking where people go. So if someone gets COVID-19, we'll know who they're exposed to. But these kind of outline some of the, these are the six criteria that uh, Governor Newsom announced several weeks ago for uh, his reconstitution plan. But a couple of weeks ago, I think he was getting so much pressure because of the economy that he's now delegated back to the local health departments to be able to make their own decisions. But we're far from having extensive contact tracing or the testing needed. Uh, the vulnerable populations continue to be vulnerable. Um, we do not have uh, any sort of treatment yet for this. So I think from our perspective, it's resilience. Uh, we've seen our, our team really uh, rise up. We've had great participation at our lab. If you go down to our plant, the plant looks different and I'll show you some slides of that. Um, here, at, uh, we've been thinking about bring, before we can bring our telecommute engineers back to work, no one's gonna wanna take BART. BART's like a pe Petri dish. You might as well, you know, go into a COVID-19 uh, hospital because it, you're, you're gonna be exposed. So we're making sure we maximize parking for our employees. Social distancing is the new norm. We're starting to um, purchase and install plexiglass. And we're gonna make sure that any of our cubicles when people come back is observing six foot social distancing. People may have to only be in certain days. So their office mate won't be, they'll be in opposite days. This just shows you kind of some of the plexiglass that we're considering and increasing the height of the walls. Um, there's gonna be no more talking at the water cooler and the new, it's gonna be a new normal. And so at the coffee, at the coffee room and the water coolers, there's signs up right now. You've got to observe social distancing and you're going to have to talk to your coworker being at least six feet apart and you're going to wear a mask in the common area. So what have we done at our main wastewater treatment plant? Well, to observe social distancing for our maintenance staff, we've staggered their hours. The lab staff, we've staggered the hours. We've gone out and purchased multiple trailers like you see here in the photo. And what we've done with these photos, uh, the photo on the right shows we've set up tables and chairs. This particular trailer is for our maintenance workers so that they're not all in the same quarters when they chain at break time and stuff. We've also procured several of these that are set up with the uh, computers and the control screens. So no longer do we have multiple operators in our main control room at the main plant. We now have multiple control rooms with trailers. If you go to our plant today, it might look a little bit like a circus. You're going to see happy operators and maintenance staff riding around on large tricycles and bicycles and riding carts. We've purchased these in response to COVID-19. We are no longer having two people per vehicle. So to get around on the large uh, plant grounds, we've got tricycles, bicycles, and carts. You get to pick your mode of transportation, but our operations maintenance staff have embraced it. And then with regard to the lab, we've turned our lab into a seven day a week operation. Our staff actually embrace it. A lot of them are parents and they wanna be able to be home doing two days during the week and to be able to do homeschooling with their kids. And they'll come in and work Saturday and Sunday and their partner will take care of the kids. So over a third of our staff are now working also on Saturday and Sunday and it's allowed us to be able to observe social distancing. And then the tricky part is the social distancing in the fields. It's no longer going to be like that. Everyone's going to have masks on and they're going to have to make sure that they're six feet apart. And then we recognize there's inefficiencies. As you can see in these photos, I've been on Microsoft Teams meetings. The next thing I see my kids, my coworkers, three-year-old kids saying hi. Um, so we just acknowledge that. As you can see the photo in the lower right, someone with a newborn and a toddler, I just, it's, it's, it's the new norm for those with young kids and I've just learned to expect that. And you know, I think during this time of a major global pandemic, it requires collaborative and empathetic leadership. And um, then you have your team behind you. What's the fiscal impacts? We're fortunate that this happened late in fiscal 20, that we're gonna be fine for fiscal year 20. 
but for fiscal year 21, the impact, impacts are unknown. We've already seen more people calling in saying they can't pay their bills. There's no incentive to pay your bill. If you're unemployed, why pay your water sewer bill when they're not gonna turn off your water, right? And we're gonna make payment plans, but we know the reality is it's the largest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And I think it's gonna to continue to grow as long as we don't have a vaccine. So from our perspective, we gotta recognize there's service area economic impacts. There's gonna be lower water demand. There's increased need for customer assistance. There's gonna be decreased development. We're not gonna get $50 million in system capacity charges this year. That's the new reality. Increased delinquency. And what are the tools in our toolbox? Well, the tools in our toolbox is we are pursuing state and federal funding to help our low income customers. Um, how successful we'll be, time will tell. We do, we're fortunate that over the last 10 years, our general manager, Alex Code, and, and our board of directors has done a great job. We have good financial stability. We have $95 million on our water system uh, reserves. But depending on the scenario, you could spend that in a year very quickly. Uh, we're looking at a potential rate increase July 1st. The decision before our board in a few weeks, do you go forward with that rate increase? That's a board decision, but I think the options is to lay out alternatives for the board. And what's the impact of not going forward? Losing $50 million next year and then losing that in our rate model for the next five years, those are things to think about. Or do you defer? Do you, instead of putting out your rate increase on July 1st, do you do it, but do you put it out until the fall when maybe you think the economy is better? Or you defer for six months? Those are some of the options that are ahead of us as we look to having a potential rate increase effective July 1st. But this is not a spectator sport. We need to be monitoring right now. We need to be looking at the various financial models and figuring out what if we lose 10% of our revenue? What if we lose 20% of our revenue? On the wastewater side, 50% of our revenue, 70% of our revenue is fixed and 30% is variable. On the water system, it's the opposite. Most of it is, is variable. Over 80% of our revenue on the water side is from water sales revenue. So we need to look at what if we lose 10% of that? What if we lose 20%? So the fiscal impact is unknown. And I think the key is you do your planning now, you have your strategies, so you're ready to execute depending on what happens. So probably a lot of you have seen this. This, was, this came out recently as a prediction of what's, what's potentially to come. And it's a very sobering picture uh, for the Bay Area. This was put out by the National League of Cities. And as you can see, they're expecting a lot of furloughs, layoffs. I think uh, since this came out, I heard the governor is expecting uh, the state workers to take a 10% pay cut. I heard the city of Palo Alto. Uh, I was on a call with their city engineer last Friday. They're gonna take a 10% pay cut and have furloughs. So there's uncertainty. And I think our job is to be prepared for the uncertainty and not sit back and be reactive, but be proactive. But for East Bay Mud, our priorities are the same. My priorities is number one, protect our employees. I must always provide them a safe working environment. We need to protect public health and we need to protect. Those are our goals and collaborate. Eileen, I think that you may have cut out really quickly. You were on collaboration. And it's we'll be stronger at the end of all this. We'll look Eileen, say we learned a lot. Hi, Eileen, would you mind repeating the collaboration is key portion? There will no longer be the crowds. So with that, I say thank you, and um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Eileen. That was wonderful. Um, we missed a little bit of the end of your collaboration is key portion, but I think that the visual probably provided most of what we were, we were looking to understand, and perhaps it'll get hit on again in the question and answer section. Um, I wanted to just mention to everyone some of the comments that are in the chat are not necessarily questions, but just information. So it's worth reading through the chat if you're interested. Eileen, that's available to you after. 
Um, but I'm gonna just send forward some of the ones that were definitely questions and, and kind of start with those that didn't relate to the COVID portion of the presentation and then get to those um, a little bit later. Um, but the first question that came in was about uh, the good neighbor approach to the surrounding communities that you had mentioned. Jim asked, can you describe that further and how have you involved them? Do you have a citizens advisory committee or anything? Right, so we don't have, I, we, we, we talked about that as a group and I didn't want to have an official citizens advisory group because I want to be cautious that a lot of this is not asking for their input on, right at this point. Um, we had a meeting, well now we're, we're, we're supposed to have a meeting, we were in March, but of course that got canceled. Um, and that group is not necessarily a group that's maybe as sophisticated with technology. So I met with them and told them about it as early as over a year ago, said we were embarking on this, told them about it and says when we have more information, we'll come back and we can, we were thinking of doing like book groups, kind of like those of you who are interested in nutrients, we'll tell you about nutrients. We're going to tell you about where we're, so our plan was, but it's it's kind of on hold right now. Those of you who want to talk about odors and and what and, and want to know more about what we're doing to manage odors at the plant. So we the last time I actually talked to them was many months ago, and we had planned, and I told them it was going to take us time because we needed to do our condition assessments. We needed to get some information, um, and then when we were when we had enough information to share and engage with them again, we were planning to come back and have multiple meetings with them. And it was more to kind of share and get their input, but certain things, the regulations are driving some of it. And I think as long, I think the main message is to them is, we know you're a neighbor and it's like my neighbor that lives on each side of me and, and my own house is, you wanna be a good neighbor and we're well aware that the neighborhood has changed. And so we even have to be better about more vigilance. You know, when that plant was built, there was no target out the back gate. There was no best buy. A year ago, uh, they were looking at potentially building a, a big hotel uh, near where Best Buy was, a new hotel. So I think the main message when we reached out to them was we want to be a good neighbor. And I normally have met with the West Oakland neighborhood uh, group anyway regularly. We've been meeting with them over the last year pretty regularly because of some of the air toxics regulation rules. And we've been part of that community group. Wonderful, thank you. That was very thorough. Um, most of the other questions kind of related to the COVID-19 presentation. The first one that came in was just asking you to confirm that the testing that you're doing is being done mandatory or is it being done mandatory or voluntarily? And, and I think you kind of explained that this is a, an interest East Bay Med has taken, but just would you mind kind of confirming that? Yeah, yeah, because actually it's changing. So right now the testing that we're doing is it's only for our operators uh, uh, wastewater operators, wastewater maintenance staff, and lab staff, and the water system operators. That's all it is with right now. We're looking to expand it to some of the other field workers. It's voluntary at this point. I know our board would like it to be mandatory, um, but at this point we've kept it voluntary. And I should be very clear that how I spend a lot of my time these days is meeting with the units. So I meet with the unions probably at least three times a week. Um, so I meet with unions, we, we're collaborative, we listen, we'll agree to disagree on things and I'll move forward with what I need to move forward with. But at this point, it's a voluntary program. I do know that I think our board ultimately would like it to be mandatory for our critical workers. We haven't gone there uh, yet. Part of the reasons a few people have decided not to participate is they said they don't have symptoms and they don't wanna take the testing away from they think people who need it. Mm -hmm. So maybe as the testing becomes more prevalent, um, and I understand in Contra Costa County, anybody in Contra Costa County can get tested now. So I think that will get more people take, making, taking advantage of this voluntary program. That makes sense. And Jan actually asked, did you provide employees with thermometers for symptom self-check? No, we do not. Um, we do not. I think one of the reasons we don't is because thermometers are very hard to get. I know my husband ordered a thermometer, fortunately, only like a month before, and ours only arrived the week before. I don't have little kids. I don't get sick. We didn't even have a thermometer, and they're very hard to get. So if you read the thing, it says, do you have a fever? And I'm not sure everybody actually, I take my temperature every day before coming to work. I'm not sure everybody does. It doesn't say, did you take your temperature, and is it 98.6? It says, does you do you have a fever? So... Um, and, and that's another thing that people have discussed, 
is do we take temperatures of, of people before coming into the plant? And it's interesting because different people, even within the union, there's different philosophies. But at this time, we, we do not take temperatures. And we're also very careful as we work with all of this stuff that um, we're careful of this private information. That checklist information goes to the supervisor. And if anybody checks yes, then it goes to our HR um, health coordinator who then follows up with the employee. But you, I can't take my, my staff's information and send that anywhere. We've got to make sure we're not violating HIPAA. Great. Well, I mean, um, this is Jan. And I think we've been looking at whether to make man symptom self checks mandatory or voluntary, but we were struggling with that fever or temperature check because we do know that not everyone has a thermometer and, and sort of how do they gauge that. And we are running into the same issue that you are. It's very hard to get thermometers. So, so this is granted, granted this is, this is a, hopefully a very tight knit group I'm talking to. <laughs> we even address the thermometer thing. We just said this checklist, it went into effect whatever many weeks ago. If you're gonna report to work, before you can report to work, you must complete this checklist and tell your supervisor you check no when you're going to report to work. If you check yes, you have to notify your supervisor you checked yes to one of them. You're not reporting to work. And then we send that to our, our uh, HR person who will follow up with the employee to see what their symptoms are and should they be self-quarantined. So we never said, have you taken your, your temperature, Eileen? It says, do you have a fever? So you could do what we did, Jan, and this is for us. It says, do you have a fever? I know when I was a young kid, my mom would touch my forehead. <laughs> I was one okay. of the kids. Ah, Eileen doesn't have the fever, but her sister definitely has a high fever. My other sister has a high fever. Another brother doesn't. So I don't know what people are doing. It, it says, do you have a fever? It didn't say, did you take your temperature? Okay. Thanks, Eileen. Hopefully that's helpful. That's just my, <laughs> I never ask anyone. I just, I take it if someone says, that they, they check no to anything, I let our HR coordinator know and she'll follow up. And then they won't report to work and she'll advise them whether they have to contact their doctor or whether they have to self-quarantine depending on the symptoms. Okay. Thank you, Eileen. And Barbara just kind of chimed in and said, you know, it's important to know that you can have symptoms and be, or not have symptoms and be a carrier. So she just was mentioning the operator should wear a mask. But from what I understood from your presentation, it sounds like all your operators are wearing masks. Is that correct? Yeah, so initially when this first started, we weren't, we made it optional, but with, I, um, I forget which shelter in place order that got extended that it's, it's been over a month ago now that, and when I'm in my closed office right now, I'm not wearing a mask. But um, if I walk down the hall to use the restroom or get a drink of water, I have a mask. So if you're in common areas, if I'm at the plant, I was at the plant last week walking around just to check on things and walking around the plant when I'm in common areas, in which the plant is, you've got to have a mask. The only time you don't have to have a mask on is if you're in, in a closed office. So when I go down like to the boardroom, um, board meeting day, our board's calling in on Microsoft Teams. It's only a few senior managers that are there. We have to wear a mask the entire time because we're in a room with others. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, Anne had asked, has uh, the CDC embraced the wastewater study? Are there plans to roll out testing out nationally coming from the CDC? Okay, so, um, and I don't want to be critical, um, but I've been on two national webinars with Ann Kirby of the Centers for Disease Control. She's a brilliant scientist um, and wonderful. When, um, so, so she's embraced it. Oh, she's embraced it completely. I mean, she coordinated me with the University of South Carolina because that's who CDC works with, where we're shipping our sewage to. They embrace it. I asked her for money. Unfortunately, she loves the idea, but she can't make it happen. Mm. She doesn't have the money. So she knows what I'm doing. She was on a webinar, a national webinar with me. I think it was two weeks ago today. We've been on two national webinars together and, and I talk with her. I got to know her through my, uh, the, the Princess cruise ship because I, I wanted to be able to tell my staff that I coordinated with the Centers for Disease Control. So I've been on two national webinars with Ann Kirby talking about it. She embraces it, but she can't make it happen. She can't make it happen. The universities can't make it happen. Doing is I'm trying to make it happen. I'm connecting everybody. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I, 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 I've read the studies. I bring in people together. 
Uh, in particular, I've got a brilliant professor at, at Berkeley who's also a can-do attitude, and we've got money. And if we can get the, the logistics of the lab worked out, where we can sample hundreds of samples a day, I told them there's over 100 members in CASA in California. I can get all the sewage we need. I have lots of people who want to participate, but that's been the holdup. But to answer your question, she embraces it, but they can't move, they move slow, um, and they can't provide the money. So she's relying on me to run with it, and they're excited. And the county health officers are excited. They can't wait to hear back from me. I was on a call with them a week ago, and I said, well, we were, I think we have another conference call next week. So I'm running with this, and I'm running Chasing Private Funding. Got it. Okay. And when you say the county health officers, I assume that means both Alameda and Contra Costa's county health officers? Alameda, uh, so the phone call was, and, and we have another one coming up, I think it's next week. It's Alameda County Public Health Officer, Contra Costa Public Health Officer, and the city of Berkeley has their own. Mm -hmm. And so they were on the call too. Okay, and, wonderful. And Berkeley's really interested because they want to help guide their decision about do they open up with a hybrid approach next year. So they've got an incentive and so I'm working with two different professors at a, I had to connect the two professors at Berkeley, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> two labs, one, one in environmental engineering and, and one who's uh, in the biotics. Um, but anyway, it's great. I've got, I've, I've got a great team. I've got all the right players. I've got the largest healthcare provider in California. Everyone's interested. So I just need the lab kinks to be worked out. And to go national, I need more money. Understandable. Okay. Uh, Carson had asked, is East Bay Mud looking into facility office space HVAC modifications such as UV? And really quick before you answer that, I want to just mention East Bay Leadership Council actually had an economic development task force talking about this, like what modifications buildings might be looking at. If anyone is interested, it's available in the member uh, portal on the East Bay Leadership Council's website. It was an economic development task force. But anyway, to repeat the question for you, Eileen, is East Bay Mud looking into facility office space HVAC modifications such as UV? So at this time, no, uh, this building here, at the main building downtown is nine floors. Uh, it's about 28 years old and they're actually doing some improvements while it's empty. I don't think we can move fast enough, to be honest. Um, I mean, I can bring it up. I, I, I'm excited to look at what you have. And then even down at the plant, we're doing some HVAC modifications at the lab. I don't think we can do it quick enough. It would be, I, we'll look into it, so thank you. But at this point, it's not part of our reconstitution plan. And quite frankly, having now be several months into it and having ran the water system, our most critical staff, to be honest, you know, if my engineers don't work as efficiently at home and the master plan gets delayed a couple months, it's not the end of the world. Who we really need right now is our water treatment operators, our wastewater treatment operators, my lab staff, and a skeleton maintenance staff to fix things. And they, they don't work in the big high rises. So the UV is to bring back, you know, in an admin building, I don't think, you know, um, we, we can allow them to do partial telecommuting. But at this point, we haven't, but it's something we can explore. I just don't know if we could execute quick enough. Okay, that makes sense. So the last question I'm going to kind of wrap us up on uh, actually came from Bob Litley, and he said, what can East Bay Leadership Council do to advance the COVID signal research and activities? How can we be helpful? Um, well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for this private pitching for funding. I mean, I, 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 I uh, if you know of any place else, Eileen's not bashful. Uh, I'll <laughs> take anybody. I'll take my slides anywhere. Um, Warner Chabot has been great of SFEI. He's like took my slides and he's been shopping them around. So if you know of anybody, if anybody knows a way into the governor's office, but given, given that he's saying tempers, I was hoping to get into the governor's office somehow. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's been a grassroots, you know, thing of mine doing, but I thought, boy, he could outdo New York's governor with this idea, but I just haven't. So if anybody has a way to get into the governor's office to share this idea, but right now, to be honest, more than the money, it's working out the logistics of the lab and the lab capacities. And if I can get this thing with Berkeley to work, then I'll, I'll have the lab capacity. Stanford's a great lab. I'm working with incredible scientists, but they're limited. University of South Carolina, I'm working with an amazing professor there, and uh, I have to coordinate when, you know, the, the sh I have to be careful what I say, when the, the shift load of, 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 our, of our waste arrives, because the campus has been shut down. So he has to get a phone call to arrive at a certain point. So the problem right now, I'd say my biggest 
bottleneck is lab capacity. And if I can get Berkeley, and we have been successful in getting some private funding. So for, for the Bayer, I think I've got the private funding, but I'll love to reach out to you. And if any of you know of any connections at the state, I've got a little PowerPoint that I, I pitched to um, stopthespread.org to get more funding. But I think the next step is in the next month, working out all these lab kinks is really the barrier. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Eileen. And, and certainly, if anyone here is interested, I'm happy to share Eileen's contact information. You guys can connect offline. Someone did recommend, Eileen, the Gates Foundation. I don't know if you've explored them and, and their work on COVID. But um, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a fantastic presentation. Uh, you bring such great energy to the task force, and I think that we all learned a lot. So thank you so much. I'm going to end my facilitation duties and turn it back over to Gary and Dan to kind of wrap this up. But thank you again, Eileen. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, Eileen, I wanted to uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, and as our audience, which has grown quite a bit since we started this uh, Water Task Force, uh, they, you can see that Eileen is very energetic and very forward thinking. So thank you for that. Uh, I circle back around to uh, the beginning part of our Water Task Force, the things that, that I miss, and, and a little bit of the COVID uh, uh, experience. And I do miss seeing everybody in the room at our Water Task Force. I miss the, the pastries that uh, uh, Brown and yeah. Colwell provide. Uh, we don't have very many pastries around my house, so that's an opportunity for me to enjoy a pastry. Um, you know, I did. I started with uh, some statistics from the drought monitor. There's another monitor out there right now. It's called the alcohol monitor. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, the uh, sales of alcohol, uh, when you compare this March from last March, are up 55%. And it turns out that 36% of men uh, are reporting that they're drinking during the day time now. 26% uh, of the women uh, doing the same. So uh, definite impact to us. Uh, a lot of things are happening out there. Uh, you know, the the inability to socialize is 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 very tough on all of us. We're not geared that way. So hopefully soon we'll be able to have water task force meetings uh, together in the same room. Um, I get a lot out of that and from a social standpoint. So unless if there's anything else out there, again, thank you, Eileen. And, and we look forward to uh, having you participate in May. Great, thanks. Dan, was there anything you wanted to say before we just kind of wrap up our meeting here? No, no, nothing for me. Wonderful. Let's give a round of applause to Eileen. Yes, thank Yay. you so much. Eileen. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. And thank you to thank all of you who joined us. We had 36 people on the call today, which is pretty exciting. We nice have a big group and, and definitely a great topic. So uh, look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.